Hi. My name is Matt DiMaggio. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Florida's Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory. This is Eric Cassiano, standing to my left. Okay. Eric is a assistant extension scientist at the lab. And what we're here to talk to you today about is uh, rising tide conservation and our efforts at uh, breeding the first blue tangs uh, ever successfully cultured uh, in captivity. Um, so, really, rising tide started uh, out of SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Conservation Fund uh, back in about 2009. Uh, the University of Florida was brought on in about 2010. Um, and the overall goal, the, the mission, so to speak, of rising tide conservation is to promote captive breeding of reef species uh, that haven't been bred before, uh, uh, with the ultimate goal of promoting conservation uh, through these efforts. So a lot of the marine species that are uh, in the trade today, it's about 1,800 or so are imported uh, into the United States. Uh, most of those are all uh, wild collected with the ones that are grown, things like clownfish and gobies and dottybacks, um, those all have a larger pelagic egg. They're somewhat easier to grow, so to speak. Um, and the goal of Rising Tide was to focus on some of the more difficult species to grow, things like tangs, and butterfly fish, and wrasses. Um, so the University of Florida teamed up with Rising Tide, uh, which also incorporates other academic institutions like Hawaii Pacific University, uh, which is the Oceanic Institute, uh, Courtney O's over at Indian River Research and Education Center, also University of Florida, uh, Florida Keys Community College, Hub Sea World, uh, public zoos and aquariums, as well as industry stakeholders, uh, people like Spectrum Brands and Instant Ocean, um, Petco, uh, Seagrass Farms, there's a whole host of people uh, you know, who support the program. Um, these efforts in trying to raise these species that have never been cultured before. So when the program first started, we identified about five species or so that we originally wanted to, to work with. Uh, Pacific blue tangs, yellow tangs, Bartlett's anthias, uh, emperor angelfish, and uh, Bangai cardinal fish. Um, and since that time, we've, we've made some astonishing you know, efforts and, and leaps in raising some of these species. And what we want to talk to you today about is the, the efforts that we've made over that time in trying to raise the Pacific Blue Tank. Um, so uh, I'm going to hand this over to Eric, and Eric's going to tell you a little bit about uh, how that journey began and, and uh, some of the exciting uh, developments we've had. Thank you, Matthew. You're welcome. Um, so before I start, uh, I'll, I'll say something about Instant Ocean. Um, uh, when we started, our, our director, Craig Watson, wanted to emulate a landlocked facility, somewhere that didn't have access to ocean water. And so in order to do that, we had to use artificial salt water. Uh, and so uh, Instant Ocean generously donates uh, salt to us for our program. And uh, it's uh, with honor and, and proud to say that we're the only facility that has grown any of these uh, ornamental fish, the tanks exclusively, uh, that uses it Instant Ocean. And without that, uh, we would probably really still be bickering about what would be the best salt water source anyway. So. Uh, the fact that they gave it to us for free sort of took that out of the equation, uh, which is a wonderful thing and, fab and fabulous. So um, when we first started looking at Pacific Blue Tangs and wanting to grow them, uh, we had no clue what we were doing and no clue where to start. We were getting eggs from public aquariums, uh, uh, most uh, specifically Columbus Zoo uh, and, uh, and Aquarium. Uh, they'd send us eggs and we'd grow them out to uh, 10 days, and then we, they send us eggs and we grow them out to six days. Uh, we eventually acquired some brood stock and uh, had our own eggs spawning, you know, nightly or every week or so, whatever, and sometimes we'd have success and grow them out to 15 days, and then sometimes they'd die at day three. We were really lost and had no clue uh, what to do or, or, or where to look. Uh, other research partners and friends, Dr. Chad Callen at Oceanic Institute, uh, we've known him for a while, he's also a part of Rising Tide, was going through the same thing with yellow tangs. Now they've been working on yellow tangs for about 12 years, 15 years, for a while, on and off. And uh, we've been working with blue tangs at that point for about three years or something along those lines. And, and we're both lost, we'd have these phone calls all the time, like what's wrong, what, what can we do? We're seeing a lot of the same things. And then, uh, unfortunately for us, but fortunately for Chad, he, uh, he grew the yellow tanks. It was wonderful. And we instantly wanted to know, what did you do that was different? Like, what can we do to grow the blue tanks? And 
So uh, we told him, we called him up and said, whenever you're off your cloud and done being a rock star, let's have a, co a phone conversation about what you did and what we can do. And so uh, that happened uh, last Christmas, not, not the, the, the December before. And uh, we thought, I guess Matt and Craig got together and thought in their infinite wisdom that that was not enough and they needed to send somebody out there to see firsthand what was going on. And Craig and Matt were like, let's send somebody out there. They didn't send me because I would still be out there and would not come back. Uh, they sent Kevin, who was a biologist with us at the time, and Kevin came back with a few things that we weren't doing that, that we thought we might implement that would help us, and, and, and that is exactly what happened. We, uh, uh, we, we implemented some of those things, and lo and behold, we grew blue tangs. And when we first got the spawn, it was uh, May 25th of last year, and uh, we got, it was three consecutive spawns. We eventually stocked 50,000 eggs into a 1,000 liter tank and kept our fingers crossed and just started plugging away from there. Um, when we hit day 20, things look different, things look wonderful. That's when the stress overtakes you and you realize you're going to be here for the next 60 days and your wife is looking for a divorce lawyer and your kids are like, who's daddy? Who's that a strange man coming home at strange hours? Uh, but that, and that's exactly what it takes. It takes hard work and everybody working together as a team and, uh, and, and, and plugging along. I guess it would be probably around day 40 when they started to settle. I think I just missed it. But anyway, uh, uh, there's a, oh, all right. Well, maybe, maybe not, we'll see. I was around day 40 when they started to settle. They're, they're still relatively clear. I don't know if you can see over here, uh, between 36 and 40, they're starting to go down into the bottom of the tank. They're associating with this water flow that's shooting across the bottom. And they're pretty much at that point eating anything that, that we feed them. We fed them Cepapodnoplii, we fed them rotifers. We fed them Artemia, we were feeding them dry diet starting on day 20. And uh, we fed them leftover peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that were laying around. Anything that we could find that we thought they might eat. Really, it was just a high stress level at this point. We just wanted them to survive and wanted them to live. And uh, they started to color up blue. I guess it would be around day 50. And that lasted for about 15 days, a very slow process. But once they turned blue and started to get the yellow tails, then we started to give each other breaks and go home and sleep. And, and, re-associate with normal life at that point in time. Uh, uh, you know, we, had, we grew, out of the 50,000 eggs that we stocked, we grew 27. So you could do the math with your calculator there. Um, well, that was the most that had ever been grown. That was, that was sure, that was the most blue tangs that had ever been grown in captivity. So we were, we were the best at that point at growing blue tangs, uh, which, which made us feel pretty good, even, even with such a low survival rate. But I mean, what, what Eric kind of, I mean, glossed over here is that there's a lot of things that had to come together for this to be successful. All of this, oh, we fed copepods and we, you know, we got 50,000 eggs. These were, these were events that were, you know, three to five years in the making. You know, how do we produce enough cobopods to feed a giant thousand liter tank? How do we, you know, condition the broodstock to get all these eggs? It's really this, this chipping away, chipping away at the problem, trying to figure out how do we get all these, you know, get the stars to align so that we can have a shot at actually doing this. And since that time, we've been able to, to take this sort of recipe, this cookbook that we've developed here, and do it again, and we've done it an additional time at, at the, the lab at the University of Florida. Um, also, Courtney O's at Fort Pierce, the University of Florida, has done it two more times. So we've done it four times now, so we know it's not a fluke, and it seems like the methods that Chad Callen developed at OI were translatable to blue tangs, and those methods were translatable to Courtney over at another facility. And since that time, it hasn't just been tangs. Uh, Rising Tide has been really successful at raising other species of fish, uh, we've done Melanurus wrasse at the lab. Courtney O's just did spa, uh, uh, reef butterflies. Uh, Chad and Avier out in Hawaii have done uh, long nose butterflies and Hawaiian cleaner wrasses and Klein eye butterflies. So there's a lot of species and families of fish, the wrasses, the butterflies, the, the tangs that people said, oh, you're never going to be able to do those. Um, and Eric was one of those people. And I was like, well, Absolutely. blue tangs, this is going to be, you know, it's going to be 10, 15 years. You know, and that's what it took Chad, but through the, the information sharing, which is a big part of what Rising Tide Conservation is, we were able to take the 15 years it took them, collaborate, share that information, and get blue tangs down to five. And since then, butterfly fish have been, you know, falling in a couple years of research, and wrasses in a couple years of research. So the, the developments are accelerating, and we're really gaining momentum. 
And and again, a lot of that is is due in part to to this collaborative nature between not only academic institutions, but with industry, with stakeholders, with with our our farmers that are in Florida and, and scattered across the country, with input from them and wholesalers, uh, you know, collaborating on projects with industry stakeholders like. You know, Instant Ocean, who wants to support these kinds of efforts and supplying us with, you know, the uh, infrastructure and salt and people supplying tanks and pumps and everything that you could need to get this project off the ground. We've had a tremendous amount of support, um, and that's really something that I think is amazing about this initiative is just all these different entities coming together, everyone working towards the common goal of figuring out, okay, how do we produce some of these really difficult to rear species, and how do we accelerate this process? Um, and Judy St. Leisure deserves a, a huge amount of credit for you know really spearheading this effort too. Um, so uh, it's it's really exciting you know to be to be a part of, of something like this. Yeah, I, I don't have much more to say. That was actually uh, uh, well said. Yeah, in kind donations, just like the sea salt through Instant Ocean, financial contributions, and also you know the tenacity of Judy to. Uh, Judy St. Ledger, who heads up Rising Tide, to keep on us to share information, because oftentimes we get caught in our own little worlds and, and don't do that, uh, even though we're, we're friends and, and everyone is and just known each other forever. Uh, but yeah, it, it is, it, it, it's the sharing of information and, and, the, and the push to continue to do this. And we're really on the cusp of, of fantastic things. Uh, the yellow tangs were done last year, blue tangs were done. Uh, it's, it's almost like common now. To, to have grown a blue tang. And, and I hate to say that because you're absolutely right. Five years ago, I would have told you there's no way that was gonna happen. Uh, but yeah, here we are. And uh, who's, who knows what'll be next? Commercial production of tangs. That's, that, that, that's the next step. So anyway, that's all I have to say. All right, that was quick, but thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs>